Here we are, Bhagavad Gita time. We're at the end of the journey. This is chapter 18, the last chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And Arjuna is now all wise and understands all the teachings Krishna has taught him. This is a delightful story, isn't it? Let's remember that it is poetry. The, the Bhagavad Gita is 700, I think, 701 verses out of the approximately 100,000 verse Mahabharata, an epic poem, very long poem, they say is longer than the Greek Iliad and Odyssey put together. Hi, Nelly. And so this is only 700 verses out of that. And so the rest of the story wraps around the crescendo of these 18 days of the story where Arjuna is on the battlefield of life being taught by Krishna. And so this is a pretty long chapter. We'll just dive in and, oh my, hi, Adi, what a delight. Nice to see you. We're going to see you in the flesh before too very long. Anyway, so Bhagavad Gita, the chapter on, did I, did I put this here? Let me put this this way so you can see it better. How's that? Chapter 18, the wisdom of renunciation and liberation. Arjuna said, O oh, mighty armed one, speaking to Krishna, I wish to know the essence of renunciation and of relinquishing the fruits, O oh, Lord of senses, destroyer of sin. Remember that at the beginning of the journey, Arjuna wanted to run away from, from life. And he thought what he was doing was renouncing the world. But what he was doing was escapism. And so, so that all the teachings occurred. And finally, he has some understanding of that. And now he wants to know what does renunciation really mean. And then Krishna, the blessed Lord, said, the wise have known that abandoning the desire fulfilling observances is renunciation. The insightful ones say that relinquishing the fruits of all actions is relinquishing. So the renouncing has to do with setting aside the desire fulfillment. And so that applies to everybody. The actions, Swami Rama explains, the actions that are helpful and liberating in the path of spirituality have been described in the previous chapters. Now Arjuna wants to better understand the profound teachings of the path of renunciation, sannyasa, and the path of renouncing the fruits of one's actions, the path of tiaga. Aspirants who renounce the desire for pleasure are called sannyasins, and those who perform their duties skillfully and selflessly giving up the fruits of their actions are called karma yogis. Krishna tells Arjuna that there are characteristic differences between renunciates and those who perform actions but renounce the fruits. However, from time immemorial, there have been two paths, the path of renunciation and the path of action. The majority of people, wait a minute, let's see, we got somebody else. No, that was Adi, thought I saw another. The majority of people in the world follow the path of action. Only the rare and fortunate few walk the path of renunciation. Only those who have already burned their desires for self-enjoyment can walk that path. Others should not try. For the ordinary human being, the path of action is the way. And I'll note here that actually following the path of action is not ordinary. Very few people really want to do that. And so wonderful are the delightful people who want to do that right in the middle of life. When one studies various commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita, he finds an intellectual tug of war between two groups of commentators, one pulling toward renunciation 
and the other toward action. These two paths are distinct and separate, and there is no need to judge one as being better than the other. Those who do are prejudiced and act under the influence of their egos. When one studies the message of the Bhagavad Gita, he realizes that all knowledge originates from one source and finally leads one to that source. That source is pure Atman, from which springs the entire knowledge and toward which it flows through various avenues until it finally meets its source, the ocean of happiness, bliss, and peace. The Bhagavad Gita's message ends in this 18th chapter which is conclusive and decisive. When he replies to Arjuna's questions, Sri Krishna answers the questions of all aspirants. Which is the path that leads one to the immutable, unchangeable, everlasting bliss? Which is the path that should be followed? Which is renunciation and what is action? Many commentators have drawn certain conclusions because they themselves lust for the enjoyments of the world and because they think that since the majority of people of the world follow the path of action, it is superior to the path of renunciation. But to know truth, capital T, truth, one does not need the support of an army of people. Truth can and should be attained in all possible ways. To attain the absolute truth, there are various paths that lead to the same summit. It is of no use to create a war of arguments attempting to prove one path superior or inferior to another. And note the phrase there, paths that lead to the same summit important point, isn't it? In the ancient tradition, the organization of one's life was guided by the thought that one would live for at least 100 years. The first 25, the first 25 were devoted to school and learning. In the next 25, one attempted to understand relationships and intersect interactions with others and creatures of the world. The third quarter of one's life was dedicated to understanding the values of life with its currents and cross currents. The last 25 were devoted to spiritual sadhana alone. One would completely wash off the past. <clears throat> he would renounce and become totally non-attached, dedicating himself to the supreme self alone. These last 25 years were devoted to self-realization. With that systematic way of living, one finally attained the purpose of life. That was considered to be the normal procedure, and it's still wonderful and valid today, if we will but ponder it and plan our lives. But even during ancient times, a few enlightened ones joined monasteries from a very early age, renounced the normal course of life, and attained self-realization. Hi, Rosalind. And hi, Scott. The path of renunciation is meant for only a few and those who are not prepared should not tread that path. Those who learn to dedicate the fruits of all actions to the Lord and for the well-being of others are on the path. Those who renounce both actions and their fruits also follow the path to self-realization. In the path of renunciation, all actions is renounced. Therefore, the desire to receive the, receive the fruits of action is renounced as well. But in the path of action, 
action is not renounced, only the fruits are surrendered. The question might arise, is it possible for anyone to renounce all actions? This can be answered with another question. When all the actions, desires, and motivations for self-enjoyment are renounced, what is the action to be done and what is the purpose of doing actions? There remains only one action. And what is the purpose of doing actions? There remains only one action, doing action for the welfare of others. And so in this case, this applies to everybody. That action which is not done for one's own pleasure, but only for the well-being of others, does not have the power of bondage. Therefore, such action is allowed to be done in the path of renunciation. Now, if the person on the path of renunciation is doing that kind of action in the world and the person in the world is living in that kind of way, how do you tell the difference between the two? I say that just to say that they start to look very similar. And so the idea of there being two paths kind of changes a little bit, doesn't it? They become more and more one and the same. Those who follow the path of action believe that actions such as yajna, which means rituals, charity and austerities are liberating actions that should be performed. Let's see what else we got. Here. In a way, the path of renunciation, the path of that action sound alike so far. This basically, Adi, is what we're heading towards that they are not so different as they seem. And that actually, every, different people have different orientations. Some see them as radically different and never the twain shall meet. But within the perspective of the perspective of this tradition, they are really not that far apart. Look what happened with Swami Rama. There came a certain point where the boss threw him out of the Himalayas, threw him out of the caves, told him to leave go to the West and start teaching people. He arranged passage for him to leave India. He was supposed to go down to Haridwar, take a, take a train from Haridwar, go to the airport. It had been arranged for one of the students to provide the money for an airplane ticket. And Swamiji went so far, I think, I don't know if he made it even as far as Delhi, and he turned around and went back to the mountains, went back to the Himalayas and said, I don't want to go. And the boss told all the other swamis, shun him, ignore him. He's a dead man. He does not exist. And, and so they did. And he said, I want you to go serve people. There came a point and elsewhere. He said, this is a part of the way the tradition, this tradition of renunciates operates. They boot you out and they say, go teach. You know, you have to go pass this on to somebody else in the world. Now, my, my life is nothing like that of Swami Rama. I'm not a Swami Rama. I'm not a Krishna. I'm not a Christ. I'm not a Buddha. I'm not. I'm just a little guy. But I had it in my mind, wouldn't it be nice if, if I know when the last 10 years of my life is coming, when I know that the end is coming, I would like to spend the last 10 years living in the Himalayas in a cave. I had that sort of wish. And over years of time, look where I am now. I'm sitting in the middle of a town in, in, in America and here. And, and now we have what Matri likes to call a five-star cave because we have a really nice meditation room. And you're going to visit it soon, Adi. Hi, Johnny. And, and so what happened to my plan? You know, I'm here. I'm out here. And I'm in exactly the right place, the life out here in the world. It's just, it's just my life and my version of that. I had something in my mind that I can sort of run away and, and be 100% live in the cave, renunciate yogi. But it doesn't work out that way. It just doesn't work out that way. So what we start to see in some sense, uh, the orientation of this tradition, Adi, is 
uh, whoops, uh, is, is that they are not really so different after all. And, and that's the spirit of this journey that we're going through, the orientation. There have been, as Swami Rama pointed out in the introduction of this text, there are thousands of commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. Most of them are not in English or other European languages, but there's many, many commentaries. So there's different people with different perspectives. But the perspective that we're looking at that, that is where he's coming from in this tradition in writing this commentary and discussion is pretty much in alignment with what you said. They are pretty much alike. There's difference, but not so much. You know, we don't, we don't have spouses and live in the world and, and day jobs that pay paychecks. And so... When you've heard Matri, sometimes when she complains that she's overworking, she says she wants a raise. And so she'll, you know, she'll say, okay, you can have, we'll double your salary. And so double zero is still zero. It's, it's basically the invocation to the Ishupanishad that says, you know, infinity plus infinity is infinity. Subtract infinity from infinity and it's still infinity. It kind of plays that game that you, however you want to play with the arithmetic, it's still one absolute non root dual reality. So, anyway, I'm just being playful in saying that. Yes, I look forward to seeing you visit the cave. You're going to like it. We'll have fun. And Nellie said, What? I can't read it. I can't see that. It's little stars. I think that's little stars, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, thank you, Nellie. Yeah, it's a five, it's five stars. Cute. They show up on my screen faint, and so it's hard to see them for a moment. Anyway, the five star. Okay, now where was I? Those who follow the path of action believe that actions such as yajna, charity, and austerities are liberating actions that should be performed. And, and some who are living the path of action in the world actually get angry over the sannyasis, the renunciates, not performing yajna, which is rituals. I was with Swami Hari up in Tarkeshwar, up in the Himalayas, and a friend of his, a, a childhood friend of his, came there and wanted to do yajna, wanted to do some rituals over a couple days that were going to help Swami Hari's physical health. And Swami Hari was very, very upset over this. He did not want to do this because those rituals had been left behind, both because that's what sannyasis, swamis do. They leave that behind. Even a householder who had been doing rituals their whole life, they leave it behind, and he wanted to leave it behind. And because that's in the nature of our tradition to not do rituals. But here was his friend who wanted to do rituals, and I was visiting at the time, and I felt a sense of, you know, well, you go do whatever you want to do anyway. And so he came to me. He says, oh, my brother, here's my problem. I don't want to do these rituals with my friend. Will you come with me? He set up one of the bedrooms in the place and set up little fire rituals and little lamps and, and all this paraphernalia. And it was going to go something like three days. It was like three days of rituals that his friend was doing to honor him. And so the man was of pure heart. His intent was pure, but he was a householder. And what he did was rituals. It was part, it was the main part of his sadhana. And so Swami Hari sweet talked me into sitting with him. We didn't sit in there all of the, all of the hours of every day of the, I think it was three days, but we went in and sat for maybe an hour at a time for a little while. And then he would let us go and we would go back about our business. And uh, but Swami Hari recruited me to sit with him. So we're two Swami sitting there watching this man do his rituals. And, and I did it to support Swami Hari. And, and he asked anyway, just a silly little story. So those who follow path of action believe in actions such as yajna, charity, and austerities are liberating and should be performed. And the path of renunciation, actions such as meditation, contemplation, and prayer are done with the motivation of attaining liberation. Although it is important and a must in the path of renunciation, liberation is only a step towards self-realization. 
Listen to that phrase. Liberation is only a step towards self-realization. What does that mean? Note that liberation means freedom from the bondage of samskaras. It means freedom from all of the karmas. And then that is followed shortly behind it with self-realization. But it is a step. And so while in some sense they are virtually synonymous, they are not precisely synonymous. First, there has to be liberation from the samskaras. And before there's liberation from the samskaras, the first degree of, of freedom, you can say, the first degree of freedom is freedom from the bondage of the surface level manifesting of karma. Patanjali talks about this in the early sutras of chapter 2 as dealing with the gross clashes. Then we deal with the subtle clashes and how they're playing off, playing out. And then finally, we have liberation from all of the samskaras, and that leads to the uh, self-realization. So don't get thrown off by that. Don't let it confuse you there where, he, where Swamiji says liberation is only a step. It is a step, and that word only can jump off the page at us and say, wow, it's only a step? And so please don't fall for that. It's, they, they come very close together. Even after one has liberated himself from the bondage of attachment, he has yet to attain unity with the self of all. Liberating the individual self from the bondage of attachments is not the same as attaining samadhi or self-realization. And note here that here he's using the word samadhi as, as equivalent to, to, to rea, the fourth state, self-realization or atmajana. And note that this word samadhi is also used in a lesser way as part of samyama, as part of the the very concentrated one-pointedness that allows us to move, to use Viveka discernment to move beyond avidya. I hope that made sense. Let's see if we got another comment here. No. Even if one performs actions that are liberating and that do not create further bondage, he still remains an individual and he has yet to reach a higher state. He has to learn to expand consciousness and go on expanding it until he reaches universal consciousness. Now, this is good news here. Note that we're, what we're gaining here is some explanation from Swami Rama of the subtleties of this systematic process that we keep talking about. And it's nice to know the subtleties. The goal of the renunciate is to systematically fathom one after another of the various stages of consciousness that leads to the innermost one. Now, which renunciate is that he's talking about? Only the renunciate and not the householders, the people of action? No, no, no. This is everybody. The following principles are the basis of the path of renunciation. And then just ponder this, and you'll see that different people may live this out in different ways. So it's not precisely, don't accidentally throw this into the camp of only being characters that are sitting in caves and places like that. The renunciate directs all his energy toward the attainment of the goal of life, self-realization. He does not waste time and energy pursuing desires based on self-interest. Well, the person active in the world does also does not waste time pursuing those desires. Rather recognizes this is the karma yoga sections that are in the earlier chapters of the Bhagavad Gita that says, what do I do with my desires, my self-interest? I fulfill them in such a way that the fruits of those desires go to other people. There's the principle. Three, the renunciate's journey is inward. It is neither action nor inaction nor retreat. It consists of performing actions mentally and directing the mind and its modification inward rather than toward the external world. 
non-attachment is attained spontaneously because the renunciate is not involved with objects. Now there is a difference. If you're simply, if you literally have moved into the cave, then hopefully you gain non-attachment because you're not involved with the stuff of the world. The other side of that is there can be a huge trap there. Here's a way of saying it. I don't know who I heard say this years ago, but it's a way of saying it. Which is better and which is worse? To sit at home dreaming of sitting in a Himalayan cave and meditating and being in samadhi while you're sitting in your own house, which is better, to live like that or to live in a cave as a so-called renunciate, imagining in your mind everything that you left behind at home. And the principle of the question is, that's no way to live. There's nothing worse than, than living the life of a renunciate and still your mind is still trapped at home. Far better to stay at home. And, and, and this is my way of saying it. Turn your home into an ashram. Turn your home into a cave. Turn your home into a monastery. Turn it into a very special sacred place, a sanctuary for you to live in while you're busy living in the world, such as being out in the world of people and jobs and things and stuff like that. Let your home be a sanctuary. Five, with pure reason, all the samskaras are burned in the fire of knowledge. Everybody can do that. There remains only one desire, the desire for self-realization. What does everybody else do? Says, well, I have more desires than that. Well, let this one be the dominant desire. The other desires are there. What do we do with those other desires? What if you have a bucket list of desires? Some of the desires that we have, the, the easiest way to deal with them is to fulfill them. Some of the desires, as long as we fulfill the desire in a way that the fruits go to another person, the fruits are given away, then we get the joy of fulfilling that desire. I had a childhood desire to, to visit Easter Island in, out in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean. It's a place where those big, huge statues are. I saw something about that in childhood. I thought that would be neat. I never thought that I would go there. When I finally ended up being able to go there because I was in Chile with some yogis, five of us went, no, four of us went together over to Easter Island. And I was sort of escorted over there. But we had the four of us, me and, and three Chilean people went together. And we had a few days, I think we were there five days, and we had a sort of meditation retreat together. We sat for meditation together a couple times a day. We had food together. We went out and looked at statues together. We did all that stuff. I had the, I had the pleasure of being able to fulfill a, a childhood desire that, that I had thought that I had let go of decades before. I didn't think that I was ever going to show up there, and I was not sitting around for decades daydreaming about Easter Island. It was a deep, latent samskara that was still there, and the opportunity came. I don't know why it came. I have the sense that grace of guru or God or reality or truth or, or its own desire played itself out so that I, I had the good fortune of being there with three Chilean yogis, and we had a nice time together. And, and I like to think that my presence was of some service to them. They enjoyed the trip too. And I got to check it off the bucket list. And I didn't even know that it was actively there. And so we all have this. Non-attachment is spontane attained spontaneously when the erunciate is not involved with objects. They have all been consciously renounced. With pure reasons, all the samskars are burned internally in the fire of knowledge. We all do that. There remains only one desire, the desire for self-realization. That's the dominant desire. That desire does not motivate one to do actions in the external world, but becomes a means to build determination, willpower, and one-pointedness. Therefore, such desire is an essential means 
rather than an obstacle on the path. Many, many desires, most desires are obstacles. That desire is not an obstacle. It's a positive thing that's part of the means. Let's, I leave a note here. Expanding consciousness. Ex, can I elaborate on expanding consciousness? In some sense, Adi, not really. Expanding consciousness when we're one pointed and we go inward and we leave the world out here. Do you not experience some sense of expansion, of biggerness, of the moving towards infinity? Even Patanjali mentions this principle in how to do asana. Go read Yoga Sutra's instructions on asana. And how do you get a stable, steady asana? One part of that is loosening of effort to sit still, loosening of effort, and the other is to allow the awareness to have a tendency towards expansion internally. If I close my eyes, am I aware to be, am I able to be in some way aware of the whole of planet Earth? I close my eyes, my eyes are open and I'm in this little bitty room here. I'm in the living room of the ashram. My eyes are open. If I close my eyes, am I be able to be aware of a larger space, the space of the whole ashram, the space of the whole city, the space of this whole country? Am I aware, be able to be aware to some degree of the expansion of space? Play with, I think you already know what you're asking about, Andy. So I don't know if that's elaboration, but there's the principle, and it just grows and grows and grows. In the path of renunciation, self-realization alone is the goal, and so is it true with the path of action if we're good yogis, whatever that means, good yogi. And any action that does not become a means is firmly rejected and renounced. There is no half here and half there. Total dedication and devotion are essential limbs for renunciation. The path, this path of the rare few is the highest of all. It is difficult but not impossible. Those who are fully prepared should walk this path of fire and light. They should not listen to the suggestions of those who are not capable of following the path of renunciation. Remember what we were looking at earlier, uh, talking about the four stages of life, and the fourth stage of life is sannyas. So for one who's living family life, householder life, life is the path of action in the world, still sitting out there in the future is your, what we commonly call old age. You're going to get old. If you don't die, if you don't die early and you have a good longevity, question, what are you going to do with your retirement years? What are you going to do after you hit 50 or 60 or 70 years of age? What is your life plan of what to do with that? Why not plan it in such a way that those final years, ideally, theoretically, it's the final 25 years. It's the plan. Doesn't mean we achieve it. But if, we sh if we're looking at the 100-year plan, we say, what, is, what am I going to do in years 75 till 100 when I drop the body? That point, I'm going to be a renunciate. I'm going to do everything that's written here. How do I do that? Prepare now. Understand where I'm going. And then at that point, when everybody says that what you ought to be doing is playing bingo or playing cards at the retirement home with your friends and doing that kind of life. You say, no, 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 I am a yogi. And this is how I'm going to spend the last couple decades of my life. When I have retired from my work a day job in the world, when my children, that I have raised my children and they are off on their own living their lives, I will let them go and let them live their lives, and I will be a renunciate. I will do only sadhana. So it's part of life planning. So are they separate paths? Ultimately, they converge is the idea. 
Those who are not prepared to become renunciates should not think they cannot realize the self. Here you go, Adi, listen to this. That which is important to understand and attain is the state of non-attachment, without which treading either path, renunciation, or action is meaningless. It is important to do action and duties for the common good and to release oneself from the helpless and inevitable law of karma. Look what the renunciate Swami Rama did in those later years. He set off and said, we should build a hospital for the poor people. The man went off and built a hospital. Go look at that thing today. Look at the seed that he planted there. It's absolutely huge. A couple universities and lots and lots of activity. And he started this in his later years. He started this. And this was a Swami. This is a Sadhu. I visited with a man named Deshakendra Swami. Sri Sri Bharata Deshakendra Maha Swami Galu. He's, a, he's the Swami when Swami Rama left the body. The Swami who came from South India to do, I don't know what you call it properly, but in this culture here, we would call it the invocation at the, at the big party at the Bandara. The guy who came to do that is the head, he's the 24th Swami head of a lineage in South India. And his teachers started in the 1950s, building hospitals and schools and all this. Anyway, this man, the Deshkendra Swamiji, knew Swami Rama very well and tremendously, tremendously respected him and came as the whatever you call keynote speaker when Swami Rama left the body and all that. And what did he do? I spent a month with him down there in his place. And in the morning, I'd have breakfast, and I'd see him, and he'd say, you want to go with me? And I'd say, sure. And we'd get in the car, and where are we going? Well, we're going off to the mountains to go visit a hospital. And this man had a full work schedule, and he's the Swami. He's the boss of the Swamis. We also went to a monastery out in the middle of nowhere, and there was a whole bunch of swamis there, and a bunch of the village people came. And Grace of Guru it was fascinating when we were there, and we did that. I was asked to speak for 10 minutes, and I didn't speak the language. The language they spoke there was Canada, not Canada, but it's, it's K A N A D A, Canada. I don't speak Canada. And I, so I spoke, I don't remember what I talked about, but I talked, and then later, one of the one of the people uh, who spoke both English and Canada said, "Do you speak Canada?" And I said, "No. Why? Do you know what Swami, what Deshikendra Swamiji was talking about when he gave his talk to the people?" And I said, "No, I don't speak the language." He said, "The two of you gave exactly the same talk." And it was a delightful, delightful moment. Anyway, I'm just, it's just a, a, it's just a story. And so, do actions and duties for the common good. That's why Deshikendra Swami came to mind. And Swami Rama building that hospital came to mind. And these were near the end, the, uh, the end stage of Swami Rama's life. Deshikendra Swami is now getting older. I don't know what his age is. I think he's about 15 years younger than I am and he's still working. Such action becomes a means to self-realization provided, listen to this, provided the goal always remains foremost and one's actions are performed with zeal to offer all the fruits to the Lord. There you go, Adi. That's how you do it. That's how you do that, right in the middle of everything that you're doing. Yes, wow. <laughs> Yippee. Yippee. So if, if you want to follow that path, Roz, if you're, if you're wanting to follow that four-part path, notice that you grew up. You were a little girl. You grew up. You went to school. You learned something about how to be in the world. Then you spent a block of years teaching people art, doing art, selling art, doing all the work you did. You went to art school. You did a lot of education. You lived in the world. And look at what you're doing now. You're spending a lot more of your time. You've dealt with some health problems. You're spending a lot more of your time now digging deeper into sadhana. And so 
somewhere along the way, if you keep going the direction you're going, somewhere along the way, you will move from this to renunciation. It doesn't have to be formal. You don't have to go wear funny colored clothes. This is not a requirement. The principle is there. So just remember that. You know where you're headed. Wow. And so there's the principle. Such action becomes a mean, provided, listen to this again, provided the goal always remains foremost and one's actions are performed with zeal to offer all the fruits to the Lord. That brings freedom from the law of karma. Dedicating all the fruits of action to the Lord, surrendering it, Ishvara Pranadana, is, listen to this, is meditation in action, a central theme of the Bhagavad Gita. Constant meditation, meditation in action, inspiring Arjuna and all aspirants. In the path of action, self-realization is said to be attained by performing actions that are not binding, that are performed for the Lord alone. No path is superior or inferior. That which is important is to attain the wisdom of non-attachment. Listen to that sentence that Swami Rama is suggest, suggesting to it. That which is important is to attain the wisdom of non-attachment. Wow. Pretty good stuff, isn't it? This ought to be inspiring. It, it is amazing, isn't it? And you are blessed. I've told you many times years ago, I don't know if you remember it, one of the things amazing to me about you is you get kicked, you get beat up, you fall down, and, and yet you get up. That's an, it's an admirable quality. I've watched you do it over and over. You just you, you, you fall over, you get beat up, and you, and you get up again. And that's to be admired. Some contemplative thinkers say that action should be abandoned like a fault. Others say that sacrifice, charity, and ascetic actions cannot be relinquished. In this regard, hear my determination concerning relinquishment, O best of the Bharatas, O tiger among men. Relinquishment indeed is said to be of three kinds. Sacrifice, charity, and asceticism. These acts should not be abandoned. Indeed, they must be done. We must do sacrifice, charity, and asceticism are purifiers of the contemplative and the wise. Even these acts, however, should be performed after abandoning fruits, O son of Prita. This is my definite view. So who is it who needs to be aware of this principle of abandoning the fruits, coming back to somebody called me to feed my ego on an ego trip? Who needs to do that? Everybody. It doesn't matter whether living action in the world as a household or in a family, raising children, working in a job, or we're a monk living in the cave. Everybody has to learn this principle of how to offer the fruits to somebody else. You have to do it for somebody else. If Swami Rama was on an ego trip, just let's pretend for a minute, and his ego says, I'm going to build a big hospital. I want to build a big hospital. What's necessary? Find a way that you're doing it for the service of other people. So one of the ways that he has spoken of this was we, the sannyasis, have been being born and dying and reincarnating and come, incarnating and coming back over and over and over for a very long time. And these people of this Himalayan region have been feeding us. We take a body, we come, we become a, a sadhu, a renunciate, a swami again, and the householders give us food and they give us blankets and they help to arrange for shelter. And he said, well, I heard him say, he said, the debt must be repaid. And one of his ways of saying that we, the Swamis, must repay this debt 
is to provide medical care for the very people who are feeding the swamis. There is a swami, I've forgotten his name now, I used to know him rather well, lives in Gangotri in the high Himalayas. If you look at the story of living with the Himalayan masters, there's a story in there of, of an avalanche and one of Swami Rama's buddies was caught in an avalanche and he dashed over to check on him. Well, that Swami was the guru of this man I'm talking about. And when I spent time with him, he told me that Swami Rama came there and told him to set up medical services for people. Now, he was not qualified. He was not a doctor. But he was providing a medical clinic for people. And today, the people at the hospital site in India are just growing and growing and growing and serving more and more of the people living in those villages in the high Himalayas. Anyway, even these acts should be performed after abandoning the fruits. We have to figure out what to do so that whatever work we're doing in the world is benefiting somebody. You have to figure out somebody that you're doing it for. Some learned men say that all actions should be given up because actions lead one to an endless chain of reactions, thus creating a whirlpool for the performer of actions. Once one is caught in that whirlpool, it is difficult to come out of it. There is another group of learned people who believe that good actions should not be abandoned because they need not create bondage. According to them, there are two kinds of works. One leads to bondage and the other does not. Describing both renunciation and action, Krishna advises Arjuna to perform actions without any attachment in order to establish righteousness. He says that the three practices of yajna, charity, and austerity are righteous actions. Those actions performed with non-attachment and without the desire to enjoy the fruits should be practiced by those who cannot follow the path of renunciation. Adi, the comment that you made much earlier that these are starting to sound similar, one way of looking at this story is that Krishna is teaching Arjuna how to do the path of renunciation right in the middle of living an active life. That's really what we're talking about here. And not everybody agrees with that view. That's what this little paragraph from Swami Rama was about. Not everybody agrees with that. But this is what we're looking at, and this is what's being said. How do I follow the path of renunciation right in the middle of activity in life? I asked Swami Rama, he was telling me one day we were walking about the path of renunciation the, the path of Vairagya and Tiago, renunciation and non-attachment. And he was telling he was telling me, Adi, basically what you are asking about. And I was having a little trouble understanding it. And basically the bottom line was he explained to me, you don't have a wife and family. That's it. That's it. That's the only difference. This was the bottom line that, that Swami Rama gave to me. And I'm walking with him down to Ganges, wearing my funny orange dress and like that. And, and, I, and he was trying to get me to understand this point that you're asking about and that we're looking at in this chapter. And this was his way of explaining it to me. I just don't get that part of life. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. And yet I was a Swami, a renunciate, not on that path. And so we all just have to learn, look at these things, listen to the messages and soak it up over and over and over again and allow yourself to raise the question as Adi did earlier there. They seem, how? what was the word you used? They seem to be the same or similar or something like that. Now I'm not, let's see if I can find your words back here. Alike, that's the word you use. They seem to be alike. Good, that's what I'm realizing more and more. Wonderful, Adi. I hope everybody's getting that. 
Good or good and bad, give it up. It's not mine. Remember, Namaha, Om Namah Shivaya, and all the uses of Namaha, Namaha. Nothing is mine. It doesn't matter whether living action in the world or reliving as a renunciate. What is mine, M-I-N-E? Nothing. And it's the habit of Antakarna, the totality of the makeup called me, that I think this stuff is mine and it is not. Let's get a little bit more of what Krishna has to say. It is not appropriate to renounce the eternal act, to abandon that out of delusion is said to be tamasic. And this is where Arjuna was in the early, in the beginning of this story. Arjuna, Arjuna was influenced by Tamas. He was said, I'm going to do renunciation. And that, but that was delusion. If one abandons an act because it is difficult and out of a fear of discomfort to the body, upon committing such rajasic abandonment, one would not gain the result of abandoning. It's rajasic. It's rajasic renunciation. The act that is ever performed because it ought to be done, O Arjuna, giving up attachment as well as the fruit, such attachment, such relinquishment is considered sattvic. If you, I don't know, uh, Rosalind, if you are still doing teaching of art, but I'm going to pretend for a moment that you still have some art students in front of you. I don't know if you do or not, and if you don't, I'm not telling you to go do it. I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm just going to use you, if you don't mind, as a story. If you are still, uh, for those who don't know, Rosalind is a professional fine artist and does some beautiful art. And uh, she, gave, she gave me a painting lesson one time, one painting lesson. I didn't do very well, I don't think, but it was fun. It was memorable. And so if there's a person in front of you tomorrow and that person's trying to learn art, what do you do with that person in front of you? Do you renounce that action and say, no, I'm sorry, I retired from that today. Yesterday we were going through Bhagavad Gita and I have renounced that and I quit. I'm not doing any more painting. Well, what about that poor student who's trying to learn something from you? Listen to this one here. The act that is ever performed because it ought to be done, O oh Arjuna. This is Krishna telling Arjuna. If Arjuna was a professional fine artist, he's saying, Arjuna, you're an artist, and here's a student in front of you. It ought to be done not because of the fruits, not because of the money, not because of fame or whatever like that. It's because this is what's in front of me to be done. It just ought to be done. Here we are with our little bitty off in the corner of middle of nowhere world with our little bitty ashram. And so we're sitting here doing this today. I'm sitting here with you. Why? And if I do this, if I hang out with you guys like this because I think you're going to give me money or because it's going to make me some sort of famous or some such crap like that, then I am deluded. I've fallen into the trap of Tamas and Rajas. But if I'm just, you know, there's Adi and there's Rosalind and there's everybody else. And if in my heart there is simply this awareness of what Krishna is saying right here, He's saying, Arjuna, he's saying, Swami J, it just ought to be done. That's the sattvic reason for hanging out here and going through this Bhagavad Gita and Swami Rama's comment. Why it just ought to be done. And, and maybe doing this together is a benefit to some of you. And so it ought to be done. Krishna tells, Swami Rama says, Further, Krishna tells Arjuna that one should not renounce his duty under the influence of either Rajas or Thomas. Those who renounce their duties under the spell of confusion, delusion, or disappointment cannot tread the path of renunciation, but descend to the darkness of ignorance. Now, this is not to say that we should not alter what we're doing when it's appropriate. I know, Adi, you've been going through some changes in what you're doing, and 
and and that's going to modify itself over coming years. This is not saying stay stuck exactly in where they were. And I'm saying, Rosalind, I don't know exactly what you're doing with your 24-7 these days. So I don't know if the story, the way I built that applies or not. It does not say be stuck, but know that what we're doing is we're doing our actions because it's what's in front of me to do, and it just ought to be done. It's the right thing to do, and our own inner wisdom guides us in that. Giving up one's duty in a fit of emotion is tamasic renunciation, which inevitably creates misery. Those who renounce based on such motivation become a burden to themselves, to their nation, and to the whole of mankind. Goody, yes. There's some beauty in all of this, isn't it? Loosening the boundaries of ideas of good and bad. I base life on the moment in this time. Now is a good time to be, isn't it, Nelly? Yes, indeed. Where was I? They remain dependent on others for their livelihood and become poor examples to others. Sattvikas alone are capable of treading the rare path of renunciation, whether one is a monk living in a cave or one is being a renunciate right in the middle of the action of life, like Arjuna, like Krishna is teaching Arjuna to do and like Adi is trying to do and Rosalind is trying to do. It's all of us. Rajasic and Tamasic people should first learn to practice sattva. They should do their duties and should never, out of disappointment or in a fit of emotion or excitement, think of think of treading the path of life. Yeah, oh, the emphasis here is never out of disappointment, which happens. Obstacles in life are coming. There's something crashing right in front of me. There's a problem in life. I'm going to do what Arjuna started to do in the beginning. I'm going to run away, and I'm going to follow the path of light. I'm going to go be spiritual. I, I, from time to time, will get an email from a person I don't know explaining in great detail or with some with some passion how bad their life is and how abused they have been and how they need to come move in with me because they need to live in an ashram, which basically means I'm going to adopt them. And, and so we can't run away. That's the bottom line of this. We cannot run away. It's a disaster to run away. Those who are under the sway of Rajas are afraid of afflictions and their thoughts of losing and not gaining cause them serious pain. It is fear that causes them to give up actions, and we all really need to be aware of this fear phenomenon. It's the fifth klesha, Abhinivesha, in Yoga Sutras. It's the first thing that Swami Rama's teacher told him to do when he came to the West. He, he told him to leave. He said, what do you want me to do, teach them our religion? He said, no. You foolish boy, first teach them about fear, then teach them about self-realization. It's fear that causes them to give up actions. Don't drop actions out of fear. They search for pleasure by making efforts only to attain their selfish ends. If one renounces the world because of fear or pain, he gives a bad name to the path of fire and knowledge. Tamasic people are known for their inertia and sloth. Their inactivity creates misery for themselves and others. They are not fit for either the path of renunciation or the path of action. They believe in eat, drink, and be merry and remain unconscious of both the internal and external realities. For escape, they use all sorts of intoxicants the sattvic aspirants never renounce their essential duties, whether they follow the path of renunciation or the path of action. They work hard, perform their duties skillfully, and even learn to suffer to make others happy. 
Sattvikas are the rare people who are successful and always have clarity of mind. Raja, rajasikas are confused and tamasikas are ignorant. Follow the path of sattva. That's the message. Okay, let's pause there and we'll pick up next time. Okay, this is this is a deliciously beautiful chapter, this crescendo of chapter 18, but it's kind of long and has some really good stuff in it. And it plays a lot with the theme of the three gunas, which we will get more of when we come back to this, okay? To be continued. To be continued. Thank you all for visiting and playing. And, and if there's a takeaway out of this part here so far, I think it's in two areas. One is don't allow yourself to too much fall into the trap of thinking that this stuff goes only for renunciates who are living in caves. It's just simply not true. What is Arjuna learning how to do? He's learning how to be a renunciate right in the middle of action. And that's where the storyline goes. And that imply that applies to all of us. That's I think first takeaway. And the other takeaway that I hear so far in this is let us be pretty much constantly aware of a, of the effect of the three gunas, so we can operate better and better from sattva. Okay. Thanks for playing, Johnny. Thank you all for visiting. It's pretty phenomenal stuff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> all righty. To be continued. You see, after all these years, Rosalind, you're still at it. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Ponder that. Ponder that. You're still at it. All these decades you've been at this stuff. And there's Roseanne. Hi and bye. I guess you went and picked up child, huh? And got back home. So anyway, you can watch the rerun. The rerun will be up soon. So, okay. See you later. Today is Friday. So tomorrow we will be on here together with you three times. And the first two of those times, Matri will be with me together. And yes, back home, back, back home, good. And I think she said she may be with me all three times tomorrow. I'm not sure of that. I'll have to get that confirmed. But anyway, so we'll have some fun tomorrow. To be continued. Thank you all for playing. And please, be a renunciate right in the middle of life, okay? And cultivate sattva. Fare thee well. Fare thee well. Ah, yes. And om tat sat, right? That's what it's all about. Okay. And so there it is. It's in the silence after the om. Om tat sat. See you. Bye-bye, all. Have a nice meditation. And just be still and quiet and let all those worldly things fall away for a couple minutes, okay? <laughs>